This business is like the Wild West. Gold, silver, rare coins, lost treasures of history. You never know what's gonna walk through that door. Oh, whoa. There's a Civil War sword. I got robbed at gunpoint. Watch this. I'm Evan Kale, and this is Pawn Man. You guys, we have a great episode in store. Before we get into it, I want to thank our episode sponsor, Guardian Group Services. If you live in the New York area and you're looking for security training, law enforcement training, OSHA training, certification, CPR for your pets, self-defense courses, weapons training such as tasers, certification, there's a whole variety of services and certifications that Guardian Group Services offer. So check them out. Also check out Charlie Mack, Brooklyn, New York City on Instagram. He's one of my good friends here in the stacking community. So check him out. There's a link in the video description. Again, if you're in the New York area, it's Guardian Group Services, whole host of certification, training courses, and other great things that you should check out. And with that, let's get into the episode. All right, let's see what we got. Big bucket of handcuffs from the 1890s. Ah, cool. Oh, wow. Oh, these are fun. Make use of those. No, you know what? The, you know, we're going we're gonna to mulligan that one. That's not what I meant. What do you want in the handcuffs? Uh, 100? Yeah, I'll buy a hundred bucks, those are cool. Only clover to the fine one layer, that's yours. Hmm, thanks. Use all the luck I can get. Uh, I think it's Japanese pillbox? I don't know, I can't remember my Japanese hallmarks, but it's somewhere around Sterling. Is it Sterling-ish? Ish? Yeah. Okay, looks like 19, 1938. How much you want on this? Uh, that I was hoping to get two. 200 bucks? Yeah. Ooh, I'm out passing that. Okay. You're the only one I know that'll get, uh... <gasps> oh, how fun. But it's English Edwardian and it goes the proper direction, not the racist one. Oh, so this is like 1900? Yeah. It's a little plastic. What do you want on this pen? Uh, how close can you get to 100? <sighs> not very. These are hard to sell. Um, I do like $35 on it. 50? Meet you at 40. That's the size I want to go. Mm, sure. It's uh, 45. Oh, yeah, 45 on the same as I've got. 150. Is that okay? Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's kind of hard to judge. I think that's a fair price. So we're at 150, 250, 290. Alrighty. Oh my god, I look terrible right now. I'm so tired. Uh, handcuffs are cool. Make a video, I'll guarantee I can get. I'm gonna pay 100 bucks. I'm gonna get 150 on these. A swastika, I can get more than 40 bucks in it for sure. I'll probably get about 70 or 80. This surprised me. This is worth a decent amount of money. I actually might send this in. Uh, this is worth low end two, high end four. My last deal, I lost at least $1,000 with him. He completely me. Uh, way overcharged me on stuff. Last time I was here, he convinced me to buy one of his paintings that was not good. Uh, am I gonna make money on this deal though? Good question. Let's find out. I am gonna keep this four leaf clover because I need all the luck I can get. God damn it, that fucker got me again. I probably overpaid on these, but well, I paid the money. I guess I may as well use that money I paid to teach you all a lesson. Let's talk about handcuffs, where they come from, some of their history. So handcuffs actually, looks like I didn't overpay. Looks like these are worth 150 to 200. So I will make money on these. It was a little salty because I, well, I told you guys. But handcuffs, they all the way back to ancient Egypt. Paintings from ancient Egyptian tombs depict various figures with their hands bound behind their backs like a handcuff, not quite like this, not a mechanism really. And then in Rome, uh, slash in the like medieval time period, we start getting shackles, you know, because there was slavery. You have to bind somebody to transport them like cattle. You also get bilbos, which are iron bars with like sliding shackles. And these were generally used to lock the wrists and ankles of prisoners. And then of course you get into the slave trade starting in, well, the African slave trade, what's that say, like the 1500s. So then you really get the advent of shackles, but handcuffs like this, these didn't come about until about the 1800s. Or I should say the 18th century, that always throws me. In the 18th century, you get the, what is known as the Darby handcuff. This is kind of more, what we recognize is, is what a modern handcuff looks like. They're made from iron and they use the simple key mechanism. The problem was if you're crafty enough, I don't know, most people were, you get out of it pretty easily. But then in 1862, you have W.V. Adams making the design for the first ratchet style handcuff where it's adjustable and it can lock and lock tight. As this progressed into the 19th century, you have more advanced locking mechanisms. You start to change the materials to start being made from things like stainless steel. You also have chain versus hinged handcuffs. 
leg irons, there's a, there's a whole variety of ways to restrain people. How fun. Different countries develop different kinds of restraints. Some countries or some makers started having very safety mechanisms so you can't lock them too tight. And then escape artists in the late 19th century started becoming a thing. So the advent of the handcuff and that kind of played hand in hand. You know, when I saw these, I first thought of Houdini. Now what was really innovative, one of the biggest innovations was the swing through design of the handcuff where they can go all the way through. And you have law enforcement all throughout the world starting to, you know, see the novelty and really standardize handcuffs as a, as an apparatus for carrying out the law. These have also become, you know, just a huge cultural impact. When I see handcuffs, I, um, well, gang, I don't want to get into it, but I really f***ing don't like police. I had a really, 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 really bad thing happen to me years ago, and I don't, I don't like seeing these. These these upset me. Now, as far as collectors go, believe it or not, there's actually a huge market for this kind of stuff. I mean, there's, we covered in uh, the crime Halloween episode last year. We covered murderabilia and like crime memorabilia and definitely handcuffs are affiliated with crime memorabilia. Lee Harvey Oswald, I think he was handcuffed when they shot him. So the handcuffs that he was wearing when he was shot. Great example. Another weird collector might be somebody who's into some 50 shades of gray shit and really wants to turn it up with uh, an old antique to high up your lover and take a good steam and dump right on the chest. I actually won't do bad on these. I'll probably get about 150 to two. So now you know. Got some errands to run. So we're gonna go uh, out to Mobile Armory again to see my gun expert. Uh, and we're gonna get this rifle appraised and he's gonna write me a slip and maybe clean it up a little bit. It's not gonna happen today. I'm gonna just drop it off of him. He's way the f out. So we gotta go make a pilgrimage out there. I gotta get my car washed. And unfortunately, I have an insurance check for $11,000 for the damage. And it might even be more. Um, this, this car, got just f***ed by a hailstorm. It was golf ball size hail, it was on my birthday. So, I didn't know this. If you have a lien against your car and you get a check for damage, it's like really complicated to get compensated for it. Like I had to go to the bank that holds the lien to the car and they won't cash the check. They'll put it in an account and I gotta pay for the damage up front. And then they'll release the money to me. And it's like, I don't have $12,000 to blow on damage up front and waiting to get reimbursed. That'll f***ing wipe me out. So, it's gonna be such a pain in the ass that I might just sell this car back and just get a new car. So I don't know, I'll see what they offer me. And I guess from there, let me go get the gun checked out. Uh, congratulations to Steph and Spencer, my great friends. I was uh, basically Steph's maid of honor. Um, she's one of my best friends. And she got married on Monday. And you're thinking Monday wedding. Yeah, exactly. So Monday wedding, wasn't here Monday. Turned into partying all night and then I crawled out of bed on Tuesday, met up for brunch, that turned into Bender day two, and the party just kept going. Yeah, so then it turned into day three, like all day yesterday, I was basically just drowning in a bottle having fun. And then I like couldn't take anymore, and I went home at 8.30, and I slept until 10 this morning. And now I'm like, anything on there? Just the liquor swimming around in there. So, boy, it was fun. Congratulations, Steph and Spencer. Here comes the color come down. Ah! 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 All right, well this is cool. So I'm here at U Car Connect. Uh, fixing my hail is such a pain in the ass. I gotta leave my car here. Slash, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I, they might buy it back. Um, they're gonna check it out tomorrow. Uh, but they were kind enough to rent me for free an Audi Q5. So we will now be taking this out to Mobile Armory. A really quick while I'm here. These Land Rovers, I have always wanted one of these. This is one of my favorite cars. These apparently are the biggest mechanical nightmare you can buy. Like it constantly breaks, so I will never own one. But boy, this is cool. It's like, I like lighting money on fire. I'm gonna drive this. All right, I'll be out in about 45 minutes. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, good. All right, we're on the way. All right, here we are. Boy, it is busy today. I'm gonna just park on the grass. Park here, put the old hazards on. Hazards mean I can park anywhere the f I want, right? I had no idea, there's like a fundraiser going on, so it's like really, really, really busy here. So I'm gonna drop this off and get out of here. All right, so we're getting out of here. I'm gonna, I was gonna eat at the restaurant here, but it's like way too busy inside, so I'm gonna stop somewhere on the way back. I'm unbelievable, this is where I'm stopping. Now I, oh, they have Pokemon toys? I realized I haven't eaten in about two days. All I ate was liquor yesterday. So let's put some poison in my body and get back to normal. Can I get a number one and then can I get a cheeseburger too? How do I tell everybody I hate myself? Nah, I'm too much of a pussy to cut myself. I'll just eat here. This is the thing that I do. I do this when I go see my parents. I stop at Dairy Queen and Sock Center and then I have fast food on the hood of my car. In the parking lot, just like this. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty good. God, hating yourself has never tasted so good. I got uh, these four North Korean silver coins just came in stock. I kind of scale back on buying the North Korea stuff because I don't want to 
talk on Daddy Whatnot, but Daddy Whatnot did me a little dirty. But it was going great. They said, I said, can I sell it on here? You sure can. Are you sure? Oh, I'm, we're sure. Yeah, come on, do it. It'll be fine. Okay. So then it became huge. And those, those of you that remember the original auctions, you remember what was going on, how ridiculous they were. But then some ass reported me and ruined it for everyone because then Whatnot's lawyers like, or they got a complaint and like it scaled up to like their lawyers being like, hey, like we're not, you can't sell this stuff. We're not going to bat for you if we get in trouble or if like the North Koreans come after us because they don't like that you're selling their coins on our platform where you're dressed up in a shirt with Kim Jong-un doing the blood symbol and you're playing North Korean marching music laughing about how they're all stuck. So they told me I couldn't sell that anymore and this was right after I placed like an $8,000 order in North Korean stuff. I bought so much of it because yeah, I was selling it like it was selling well and it's like there's nobody else selling this stuff. I may as well be the guy but then I got stuck with all this stuff because then I suddenly didn't have anywhere to sell it because I can't sell it there I can luckily sell it on my website they don't have a problem with it but I bought too much stuff I bought way too much North Korean stuff and I kind of got stuck with it so I haven't really bought any in a while because it's been kind of slowly selling but these uh, came up for my my contact is hey, I got these silver ones do you want them oh yeah the silver ones I'll buy because the silver ones sell pretty well can't use the word investment but I think it's a pretty good spot to park your money for a collectible is a silver North Korean coin because they're so rare we have seen this one before the Pochonbo battle victory commemorative um I don't think I've had one I had one a 68 and a 7 I don't think I've had a 69 yet so this is from their bank and then this one's been graded and then I forget what this one is I've seen this one too and then this one I'm keeping because this is the 65th anniversary and I almost never see 70s and this is a 70 and it's sealed. So this one's going on my collection and these three are going on my website. Once again, you guys, I want to thank the episode sponsor, Guardian Group Services, for bringing us this very interesting subject we're going to be talking about. One that if you're a coin collector, you definitely know about it. It's kind of hard if you're a coin collector not to have heard about the Carson City Mint, the rarest mint, the most collectible mint. What the heck happened? Well, it's a very interesting story and it starts with the Comstock load. Now, this is one of the most important silver discoveries in United States history. It was in the 19th century and it led to such a significant boom in economic impact that we ended up getting the Carson City Mint just because of this. So a miner named Henry Comstock, along with, he does share credit, Ethan Allen Grosh and Hosea Below Grosh, if I'm saying that bizarre old timey long dead name, right? They originally located this area. Now this was beneath the eastern slope of Mount Davidson, and this is near Virginia City, Nevada. Now this was the first major US deposit of silver ore. And around the same time, obviously the California gold rush was going on, this was huge, huge. You know, when we think gold rush, we think, oh, it must've been so easy. You just go and pan for some gold. Oh, I found some, I'm rich. No, I mean, gold's pretty rare. It doesn't just float about. I will say like, you know, I hear about people now asking me about panning. You're not gonna find anything. And if you do, it's gonna be this big. It's gonna take forever to find and you're probably gonna spend exponentially more money trying to get it out of the ground and find it than, you know, you're basically just gambling. So. Even back then, it was still very hard to find stuff like this. So this was a very significant discovery due to the volume of it and just economically what it meant for the West. Let me describe some of the macro and microeconomic impacts that the Comstock load had. San Francisco's original growth is because of this. This also played a huge cause in the Union's victory in the Civil War. It gave the Union a lot of money because guess what? The Confederacy didn't have that territory, the Union did. This also accelerated Nevada's admission to statehood and Nevada ended up becoming a state in 1864. This also led to a bunch of mining innovations because there was so much to mine and it was so treacherous to try and mine it, they had to refine their techniques to get as much of the stuff out of the ground as they could. For one, we get the Sutro Tunnel, conceived by Adolf Sutro, and this is to provide better ventilation and drainage for mines. Now, Virginia City being so close to this load, it experienced a massive boom at its height. 25,000 people lived there, which like back then, that was a huge city. It had all the amenities and fixtures that a normal large town would, but once the silver load started to dry up, so too to the town and everything around it. By the 1880s, the boom was over, the population moved on, California was getting more popular, people were moving out there. But between 1859 and 1882, the Comstock load in 19th century dollars was about 400 million. Now adjusted for inflation, that's like 12 and a half billion dollars. And another fun fact, Mark Twain spent a lot of time in Virginia City and this was a huge influence on his life and career. Virginia City today is a historic landmark, but again, 
We're not even talking about that. The Comstock load is why we got the Carson City Mint, and that's what we're talking about. This mint only made coins for 21 years. Despite opening in 1863, it actually took years to get a single coin out. 1870 to 1885 was the first run of the coins from the Carson City Mint, and the second run came from 1889 to 1893. Now, there's a few things that set this mint apart. Number one, it has two mint mark letters, the CC. And as a coin dealer and just person in this business and collector, every time I see those two Cs, even if it's on a beat up coin, I get a excited. It's like finding a holograph Pokemon in a deck. Now this mint is also interesting because it did not mint any clad coins. It only minted silver and some gold coins. And that was due to, again, the Comstock load being right there so they could take the raw silver out of the ground and have to transport it across the country. They don't have to worry about getting robbed, train robberies, etc. It's right there, all in-house, ready to be distributed throughout the United States. Now, very much like I said, the San Francisco, the California Gold Rush established the San Francisco mint. This Comstock load established the Carson City Mint. They only minted 56.6 million coins over the 21 years that they were making coins. And it's estimated today, there's only 4 million Carson City coins total. Total. All the coins they made, there's only 4 million of them left. But who knows, it might be less, it could be more, probably not. Just to give you an idea, in 2020, which was a disaster year for the Mint, you know, we, the Mint had to shut down for half the year. They made 30 million Silver Eagles in one year. Now, it's also kind of not fair because the manufacturing process is a lot quicker now, but still. The Mint itself, like I said, established in 1863. It was an act of Congress that established it. The Mint's original building, you can go visit it, actually. It's still standing. It's a museum now. Uh, it is privately owned by the state of Nevada. It was purchased in 1939 for $10,000, and like I said, I'd love to go there. If anyone who works there is watching this, I'd love to come out and do a video. It sounds like a lot of fun. After the Mint closed in 1893, the building continued to serve as the United States Assay Office. The formal mint status, although the mint stopped making coins in 1893, it took six more years for the official mint status of it to be removed. So what exactly does drive up the price of these Carson cities? Is it just their rarity? Well, no, I think there's a little bit more to it. I think it is the romanticizing of the Wild West. When we see the Carson City mint, we think Wild West. We think, uh, you know, the gunslinging cowboy, the romantic American dream of, of what we picture that time period to be. And when we see those two Cs, we associate the two, and between the rarity and just the fact that this mint is such a fascinating story that holds hands with so much Old West history that really partially is what drives up the price. Another thing that drives up the price, the GSA hoard, which I have some here. Um, the GSA hoard was the sale of 2.9 million Carson City Morgans, and this was dumped as a big auction. Now what happened was the government had a bunch of these Morgans that they like forgot about, and then they did an audit and they found it, and so then they advertised and sold it to the public. Really, this sale kicked off the legend of the Carson City, at least the Morgan. But coins, like I said, all coins. You got those two Cs, worth money. Let's talk about some expensive examples. And by the way, this is an original pamphlet from the GSA auction. Thank you to my customer, Mike, who is actually taking me to Peter Luger in New York City. This week, Peter Luger is like the most expensive restaurant on earth. But he sold me this, and I this is not for sale, you guys. I've kept this in my showcase because it's such a great talking piece. This is an original brochure for the GSA horde. So if you see the GSA box, it's a very special thing. I see it a lot. Low end, they're worth like 250 bucks. They can be thousands. I happen to know the guy who has literally the largest GSA Morgan collection on earth. I've never seen it. I've seen pictures of it. He's probably got about $10 million collection. He's got so many of them. They used to not be that expensive, but they've just been taken off lately. So one of the top three most valuable Morgan silver dollars does come from this mint. It's an 1889 CC Morgan. It's valued at about 300K. But like the top 20 list of the most expensive American coins, most of them or a lot of them are coming from this mint, from this time period. 1876 Carson City 20 cent piece. 20 cent pieces are very rare. We haven't, actually I don't think we've covered them on here yet. We will. They didn't make them for long. Last I saw, one of those went for $207,000. An 1870 $20 gold coin one for 1.62 million and an 1873 no arrows dime there's only one example known it's a three plus million dollar coin so like i said you see those seats even a dog one even a dog one at least on a Morgan's $100. There have been efforts to make these Carson City coins again. The 2021 Morgan slash Peace Dollar restrikes 
where they remade them out of pure silver instead of 90% as a commemorative for the 100 years since the last year of the Morgan dollar, because 21 was the last year in 1921. Even though that has two CCs on the back, that was not actually struck there. Like I said, I would love to go tour this mint. Uh, again, I like kind of low-key hope somebody who works there is watching this and wants to reach out and invite me because I'd love to come. A couple other interesting facts before we close out about the Carson City Mint. A lot of Morgans were never circulated. They were struck at this mint and they were stuck away in treasury vaults. This was what was discovered in the GSA hoards. So believe it or not, there's a lot of Morgans out there that are uncirculated that are Carson City. I will quickly tell you guys, quick warning, and I didn't really want to get too much into this because I didn't want to go off the rails. Absolutely weigh every single Carson City you come across because they are faked uh, a lot. I do see them faked. Trade dollars in particular, I don't believe I've ever seen a real Carson City trade dollar. Every time I've come across them, they are fake. I've been, in fact, we've seen it here on YouTube. I've been burned on them. So you see anything that's got those two Cs, Number one, weigh it, make sure it weighs right. They make all coins the same. It's a standardized process, so the weight's gonna be the same. Even if there's a lot worn off, there shouldn't be that much differentiation. And use a loop. Look close at those two Cs. People glue them on sometimes, I'm serious. Two more fun, interesting facts. One of the coin presses used at the Mint, coin press number one, it still works. It's one of the only ones that exist that still works. It's, uh, like I said, on display at this museum. And we'll close with a little bit of true crime. James Crawford, who served as a Mint superintendent from 1874 to 1885, was murdered. Still a mystery. They don't know what happened to him. Was that for fun? Unless your name is James. And that's the magic of the Carson City Mint. Remember when you see two C's stamped on a coin. <laughs> I, I completely failed at that. I just a thing about how I got two C's stamped on my ass, but they're not super glued on, they just made a cum. All right, you guys, well, just like that, it's the end of the video. If you guys like this channel, please be sure to subscribe, hit the like button. Again, check out Guardian Group Services if you're in the New York area. They offer certification, everything from OSHA training, weapons training, self-defense, pet CPR. Whether it be an old skill or you're picking up a new one, check out Guardian Group Services. Get my books on Amazon. Again, you guys, please subscribe and follow. If you like what I do, consider becoming a Patreon here or sponsoring an episode. I could use all the help I can get. Spread the word of these videos. I could use more views, share them across social media. If you have suggestions for episodes, I'm kind of only taking them from Patreons right now, but I'm always down for new ideas. So let me know and I'll see you guys back here for another great episode of Pond Man. Later guys. <laughs>